Hey everyone, it's Margot of The Big Sco African, and this is vlog number 10. So, my last vlog was in March, and it's now July. So, if I'm trying to keep these vlogs short, I have no hope, because I don't do them often enough. How do you even attempt to recap months of 2020? It is the craziest year. And I know that's probably the same for everyone. Um, I am pretty fed up and over it. I just, it would be so nice if COVID-19 never happened. Uh, but I'm guessing I'm not alone in feeling that way. So let me try to recap the things I've been doing this year. So obviously we have been, we've had our, our own um, Corona treatment unit at the Mission Hospital here. We set up a ward. We don't actually call it the Corona ward. We call it the respiratory ward because it's too scary for Liberians to think that they're going to a Corona ward. Um, we have treated and saved lives there. We um, have also lost lives there. We of course don't have ventilators here. We don't have the same facilities here, but we do have oxygen and we've got some, some good health professionals here. So uh, there's been that. I don't want to dwell too long on Corona because honestly, I am so sick of it. I don't even want to talk about it. I've done a couple of orphanage visits this year, which is delightful and sad at the same time. It's really hard to see the children there that have no parents. And of course, I want to bring many of them home, which I can't. Um, we've done a trip out to one of the inland areas called Rivercess, where a few of us from the hospital took a training course called ETAT, which stands for Emergency Training and Assessment, sorry, Emergency Triage and Assessment Training, uh, which is a, I think it's done by the World Health Organization, and it is a really good, basic, simple training course for health professionals in developing countries. So that was really good to be able to do that. Uh, we're actually running the course again next week at the hospital because it's really good knowledge for the local staff here. Um, I have done some work at the hospital in the ER again, or ED for my Aussie friends. Um, so as you know, we set up a triage system last year. Now, the triage system that we set up, I don't wanna say it failed because that feels awful. And apparently there's no such thing as failure, it's all just part of the process. But it did teach us some things and it didn't last very well. It didn't work out the way we wanted it to. So just recently, we have um, re redone it and it is actually working really well. So I feel um, encouraged by that. It's, we did, we did better training before we started, a similar system, but we did better training and we changed the paperwork a little bit and I think we prepared everyone better. And the triage system, I would say, is now working really well. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by that because that is a very frontline defense of any hospital. And it's, it's my thing, it's my area that, I'm, that I'm, I know a lot about. So I've been really happy to be part of that. I also do a lot of work with Annette, the social worker, and I will pop in a photo of Annette so this is my beautiful friend and sister, Annette. And she, because I've started partnering with Donacy, um, we do a lot of projects together and she finds people that are in need um, or I find people that are in need and I usually get Annette's help because she's better with the language and she's better with reading people of her own culture and, and making sure we're not getting fooled um, because that's important. It's, got to have integrity when we're dealing with other people's money. So um, if you don't know what Donacy is, it's worth checking out. It's an amazing, I guess, organization. And basically what they do is they help people to help people. <laughs> um, but all you have to do is Google Donacy. I'll put something along the bottom in a, in a subtitle so you can do that. Um, but it's really changed what I do here because it's enabled me to help a lot more people than I was previously able to help. Um, and it's been extremely fulfilling to be a part of that. And I've really have been able to help, um, help a lot more people in a much more significant way. Um, so that's donacy. I do find, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of emotions that happen living in a place like this. And when people come to you in need, 
It can be incredibly heartbreaking and incredibly confronting to see the way some people are living. I have had people sob at my feet, literally holding onto my feet. I've also had people who we've helped sob with relief and joy that basically they're now able to feed their children or they're able to get that life-saving health care that they need or some sort of burden lifted off them. So as challenging as it is here, it's also very fulfilling, really. So um, yeah, it, it, it feels good a lot of the time. It feels terrible other times. So I do worry about donor fatigue because I'm always asking for money, basically. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to space out my requests as much as I can. And I feel like people are gonna get sick of being asked for money all the time. But then I think, well, I, you know, there's so many people here who are sick of starving and dying and sick of living with horrible health conditions. There was one lady who sat in the community for six months with horrendous burns. She ran into a, her house, which was on fire to save her baby. It was quite a heroic story. Ended up with horrendous burns, sat in the community for six months because she had no money for treatment until I heard about her and was able to bring her into the hospital. So there are some heartbreaking stories here. Um, but as I said, also very fulfilling. So um, let me tell you about Divine, which I will try to do without crying. <laughs> so Divine, we met a lady called Patience and Patience's story was heartbreaking in the extreme. Her husband died last year. She moved in with a, a male friend of the family who promised to support her and her two children. He ended up getting her pregnant, then demanded she have an abortion which she attempted and the abortion failed. He kicked her out. Uh, she ended up on the street. She was selling cookies, which she cooked over a coal fire. She was selling them on the street to try to support her and her children. And then when all the COVID-19 lockdowns happened, that business completely stopped. So she ended up at the hospital. She ended up taking her two children to an orphanage because she literally, they were gonna die of starvation. And she ended up at the hospital basically it's suicidal really so we attempt we did help her we were we were helping her but an ultrasound late in her pregnancy revealed that the baby had severe problems potentially as a result of the attempted abortion or it could have been a big coincidence and, and maybe it was a, gen, a con, congenital problem um, the ultrasound, it looked as though the baby had no limbs, no arms and legs. When the baby was born, we discovered it did have legs and arms, but they were very deformed, quite twisted up. Um, patients, the mother wanted nothing to do with him. And I don't really judge her for that. Actually, I've just remembered, I did a little um, video whilst I had Divine. So I ended up taking the baby for a week until we were able to place him in a, a very nice orphanage. So I'll show you that video now. Hey everyone, uh, it's Margot from the Big Sco African. I am really overdue for a vlog as always, and I don't know when I'm gonna get a chance, but I wanted to make sure I got some footage of this little man while I have him. So we've had him for the last week. He was, I guess, technically abandoned by his mother. He was born with some very significant deformities. He won't have an easy life. Um, his mother has had a very traumatic year. Very, very traumatic. Her husband has died. She's been living on the streets. Um, do, I, do I blame her for giving up this baby? I don't know, to be honest. It's, things are way more complicated than they always appear on the surface. And she really probably does not have the means to look after a baby at this time, let alone one who's so very disabled. So he's going to the orphanage tomorrow and, and I've looked after him the past week and given him love and cuddles and prayers. I've been told it's a good orphanage, so they will love him there. And we're still gonna try for an overseas adoption. Um, yes, I have fallen in love with him and it will be very hard to say goodbye to him tomorrow. There will be tears, definitely. Hey, little man. Yeah, uh, but I have no regrets. It's 
really important for babies in their first days of life to have human contact and if I didn't bring him home he would have just been sat on a bed in the peds ward. He would have been fed and sheltered but the nurses don't have time to, to give a newborn what he really needs. So definitely no regrets. As hard as it is, um, I would do it again in, in a heartbeat. So, yes, divine. Um, those of you who follow us on Facebook um, and our email supporters will know that divine did actually pass away. So he had he had so many problems with his little body, and we don't know what. I mean, we we could see his external problems and and how his internal problems. We don't even know. So um, he got very sick, uh, and he did die which i found um i mean i it was it was it was devastating um but at the same time bittersweet because he will of course have a a beautiful life growing up in heaven um but i want to share something fairly profound that happened to me with the story of divine so when divine was he the orf he went to the orphanage after i'd had him a week and a few days later they brought him back quite sick and it was he was in hospital for a day or so before we realized this is not something he can actually recover from um this is we, we're not going to save him and so basically he went home with my friend susie back to the orphanage and she cared for him until he died uh, a few days later and during that time i went from all extremes of emotion from from one thing to the next. Um, and I do remember one day in particular, and this was a turning point for me, where I got really angry at God, like super angry. And I wanted him to just take Divine home. He was suffering, it was breaking my heart. I was questioning God and, and asking him, why did you even allow him to be born in the first place? He would have been better not even living and knowing the suffering of this earth. Um, and I got really angry at God because he wasn't doing what I wanted. And I went down to the beach, I had a big cry, I ranted and raved. The beach is quite deserted here. And yelled at God, I told him how he was mean and how he should have, he should have fixed this situation, he should have made it better. Um, I said some awful things to God, I really did. I was so angry and just so, probably a bit traumatized by the whole thing and then I stood there on the beach and waited for my punishment I thought oh I've I'm in trouble now I'm in for it I've I've said I've told God he's mean I've told him he doesn't care I'm I waited for his wrath basically and as I stood there looking at the heavens I felt the most overwhelming love I just felt God's love pouring out on me <laughs> And it was just like he was saying, you know what, Margot, I understand your pain and I love you. And it doesn't matter what you say to me, I will always love you. And I just crumbled. I just, it was a profound moment for me where I realized nothing I do can separate me from the love of God. And not only that, but he understands it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad, he understands. And after that moment, I experienced much more his peace. And I still don't understand the whole situation. I don't know why, you know, I just feel like it would be better if he was never born. Um, I don't understand it. I don't understand why the actions of a mother could affect an innocent baby so, so profoundly. I still don't understand. But what I do understand is that God is good, He is love, and I'll ask Him myself one day. But one day I will go to heaven and I will see divine, and it will be a, a beautiful and wonderful reunion for us. So I wanted to share that little story with you um, because it was, yeah, it was a really significant moment in my life. And I have grieved divine, and um, I do miss Him.
He's only in my life for a couple of weeks, but I miss him. So life goes on. Um, life here can be really awkward at times. I find compound, living on a compound has pros and cons. In some ways, it's really nice. I love the family atmosphere of the place. And anytime I need something, there's any number of people around here that I can ask. At the same time, you lose a lot of your privacy. You know, I've always got guards walking past my window or or people coming to the front door just to, to yell out hello to me. And, you know, sometimes I, I do miss my privacy a bit. Um, the going into town to go to, sh to do shopping or the bank, it's, it's always interesting. The traffic's always pretty horrendous and chaotic. We have a cash flow crisis in Liberia, which has been going on almost since we got here, um, trying to get cash from ATMs. It's a cash society here. There are very few places that will accept card. So you need to have lots of cash. And since I've started doing donacy, uh, I need a lot of cash and it's really hard to get. Um, so that is something that you could actually pray about for us that we could get the cash we need. The, the AT One day I went to nine different cash machines and none of them had cash. So that's something that is a, an ongoing frustration for us. So feel free to pray. I notice that I'm nearly up to 15 minutes, so I need to end this vlog. Thank you for listening to my ramblings and um, hopefully I will talk to you all again soon. Love you all heaps. Bye.